Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons is for April, May, and June of 2017, entitled Feed My Sheep, and it's on the first and second epistles or letters of Peter. And this particular lesson focuses primarily on, on 1 Peter, the first chapter, entitled An Inheritance Incorruptible. This is a lesson for April 8 of 2017. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and Father, we thank you so much for these inspired records that we can read, we can dig and understand and be inspired. We thank you for the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we study these records. May he lead us into the correct paths is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We need to begin by making a slight apology. Um, for some reason, our t TV screen behind me has not working at the moment. We can't figure out what the problem is, so that will not be visible today. So in this lesson, it, we will take up the challenge of understanding 1 Peter, the first chapter. We've suggested on numerous occasions that in order to fully comprehend the meaning of a letter, which 1 Peter is, we must try to understand, one, the person who was writing, two, the people to whom it was written, and if possible, three, why it was written, now you've got to start reading minds, and four, the setting in which all of this happened. Much of the New Testament is composed of letters. So each time we look at one of these letters, we must ask the same set of questions. And ultimately, what does this message and an understanding of it in depth mean to us in our day? We believe this letter was inspired by God. So what is God trying to say to us? Well, there's a lot of discussion among scholars about almost every book of the New Testament. Who wrote these books? When did they write them? And First Peter, of course, is no exception. Although there are skeptics who claim that 1 Peter was written by someone else sometime later in the second century, most scholars agree that there is good evidence that Peter himself wrote it sometimes in the 60s AD, which would mean just a little while before he was finally uh, crucified upside down. William Barclay, a famous uh, New Testament scholar, wrote these words. What is most significant of all is that the theology of 1 Peter is the theology of the very early church. E.G. Selwyn has made a detailed study of this, and he has pro proved beyond all question that theological ideas of 1 Peter are exactly the same as those we meet in the recorded sermons of Peter in the early chapters of Acts. So what is the main, what's the main message of these early sermons and, and messages from Peter? Well, the preaching of the early church was based on five main ideas, and we're going to try to review those ideas. One of the greatest contributions of C.H. Dodd to New Testament scholar, um, um, scholarship was his formulation of these. They form the framework of all the sermons of the early church as recorded in Acts, and they are the foundation of the thought of all the New Testament writers. So the summary of these basic ideas has been given the name kerugma, which means, that's of course a Greek word, which means the announcement or the proclamation of a herald. So if someone comes and there's a, the emperor wants to make an announcement or something and he's blowing with a trumpet, that's a kerugma. These are the fundamental ideas which the church in its first days heralded forth. We shall take them one by one and shall set down after each, first, the references in the early chapters of Acts, and second, the references in 1 Peter. And we will make the significant discovery that the basic ideas of the sermons of the early church and the theology of 1 Peter are precisely the same. We're not claiming, of course, that the sermons and acts are verbatim reports of what was actually preached. But we believe that they give correctly the substance of the message of the first preach preachers. Now, before we jump into these ideas, let me say that if you're interested in this material, uh, there's a lot of material on 1 Peter available on our website at theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And these very uh, lessons 
are up there available for you if you want to download them and use them in a class or studying them yourself. So all this information is right there. So what are these five main ideas, Gary? The first one is the age of fulfillment has dawned. The messianic age has begun. This is God's last word. A new order is being inaugurated and the elect are summoned to join the new community. And then we're given the verses both in the book of Acts and then in 1 Peter that show that parallel. So what's the second main theme here? Second is, this new age has come through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, all of which are in direct fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament and are therefore the result of of the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. And again, passages in Acts and passages in 1 Peter. So now let's, let's try to formulate in our mind what's going on here. Peter is, in his sermons in Acts and in this first letter here, he's saying, look, this is what was prophesied in the Old Testament. We have now, we are now, we have now seen the fulfillment of those ideas. We are in the new age. And this, the life and death and the resurrection of Jesus are the fulfillment of those Old Testament prophecies, right? Okay. Number three. Number three. By virtue of the resurrection, Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God and is the messianic head of the new Israel. Okay. So... Not only did Jesus come and live and minister and die and was ro rose from the dead here on this earth, but then what happens to him? He returns to his rightful position beside the Father in heaven. Okay, Tim. These messianic events will shortly reach their consummation in the return of Christ in glory and the judgment of the living and the dead. And then the text of okay. Acts and Peter. Exactly. So, what did the disciples believe about the second coming of Jesus? It was going to happen. They thought it was going to happen right around, very soon, right around them, didn't they? Well, and then number five, these facts are made the grounds for an appeal for repentance and the offer of forgiveness and of the Holy Spirit and the promise of eternal life. So, all of that, those are the kind of ideas we were hoping to find and, and actually delineate here in First Peter in, in association with his, the ideas that were preached in the book of Acts. So these declarations are the five main planks in the edifice of early Christian preaching. Some of us have suggested, and I'd like to hear your comments right now, that these ideas were suggested by Jesus in his first post-resurrection sermon. And who did he give that first post-resurrection sermon to? The disciples, the two, quote, disciples on the road to Emmaus. Exactly. So it's very possible that Jesus sort of laid out, he said, look at what, look what the Old Testament says. And he says, he started from Moses to the prophets, laid it all out. So they are also the dominant ideas in First Peter. The correspondence is so close and so consistent that we almost certainly, with entire probability, see the same hand and mind in both. So this is two reasonably conservative people, unless we're really, really critical. This is a proof of what? The authorship of Peter. That, that the people, the, the Peter who preached in, in the book of Acts and those brief summaries of his sermons are recorded is the same one who wrote the book of First Peter, right? I wonder what the significance is, back to paragraph um, 5. These facts are made the grounds for an appeal for repentance and offer of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to see if there's another, t uh, my uh, RSV says forgiveness, but a, a better translation would probably be for remission of sin. Mm -hmm. Because okay. isn't God forgiveness personified? Yeah. It, I mean, he does, remember when he told the story of the, the disciples, how many times you should forgive? Seven times seven? No, Jesus says 70 times seven, which yeah. my understanding would be always be forgiving. Of course, mm -hmm. Jesus on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So I don't think forgiveness is the issue. Well, it, no, you're right. 
as far as God is concerned, is not the issue at all. And, but people are concerned, and that's the way translations yes, always come across. Exactly. If, if, if you're terribly worried that God is not going to accept you, then forgiveness is important. Yeah. So but from they, their perspective, yeah, no, you're right. Well, Peter was obviously repeating the basic core message of the gospel. But Peter was writing to his fellow Christians in a time of great difficulty. So what is one of the main themes that we're going we're gonna to see talked about? What's, what's going on among these people in northern, we'll look at that in a moment, but in northern, the northern part of what would be modern day Turkey? Tribulation. Yeah, persecution. persecution, yeah. And how are they, let's just talk about it for a moment, how are they worshiping? I mean, you just go out and they build themselves a nice church with a steeple, they were in homes. Why were they in homes? They were not even allowed to build a church to begin with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And what did the Roman government say? And we're going to read more details about that in a little bit. Christianity was a forbidden religion. Okay? Which is interesting, considering that the Jews were not forbidden. Yeah. Christianity was. But the Jews were allowed to persist with their religion because it was recognized as a national religion. It was, it, it was their religion, and so people just recognize, okay, you're a Jew, you're automatically, you worship in this particular way, and we may not like it, but we tolerate it. But Christianity was a new religion, and Rome was not happy with that. We'll read about that in a moment. So this letter was written in a time when persecution was threatened, and that's abundantly clear. They are in the midst of various trials, chapter 1, verse 6, they are likely to be falsely accused as evildoers, chapter 3, verse 16. A fiery ordeal is going to try them, chapter 4, verse 12. When they suffer, they are to commit themselves to God, verses, chapter 4, verse 19. They may well have to suffer for righteousness' sake, chapter 3, verse 14. They are sharing in the afflictions which the Christian brotherhood throughout the world is called upon to endure, chapter 5, verse 9. So we can, we've already gotten a sort of a bird's eye view of, of 1 Peter. At the back of this letter, there are fiery trial. There, they are fiery trial, a campaign of slander and suffering for the sake of Christ. Can we identify this situation? How did it happen? Well, there was a time when the Christians had little, fear, little to fear from the Roman government. Why was that? They probably consider them the sect of the Jews, and the Jews were yeah. legitimate, so... Yeah, there's no, no big deal. These are just a small group of people. They're a little offshoot of the Jews, so just leave them alone. They'll die out, and we won't ever hear from them again. Well, when did the change come? Well, you have to re 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 repeat a little bit of history here. The change came in the days of Nero, and we can trace almost every detail of the story. On the 19th of July in A.D. 64, that's, when did Peter die? Do you remember? Either A.D. 67, probably in the early spring of A.D. 68. So this would be four years, about four years before Peter's death. The great fire of Rome broke out. Rome, a city of narrow streets and high wooden tenements, was in real danger of being wiped out. The fire burned for three days and three nights, was checked and then broke out again with redoubled violence. The Roman populace, the people living in Rome, had no doubt who was responsible and put the blame on the emperor. Who was the emperor at that point in time? Nero. Nero. Nero had a passion for building, and they believed so that, so that he had deliberately taken steps to obliterate Rome that he might build it again. Two of Nero's court of favorites were Jewish proselytes. What's a proselyte? For some of our audience who may not be familiar with that word. Converts to Judaism. Convert to Judaism, right. There was Alaturus, his favorite actor, and there was Papae, his mistress. It is very likely that the Jews through them influenced Nero to take action against the Christians. In any event, the blame for the fire was attached to the Christians and a savage outbreak of persecution occurred. Nor was it simply persecution by legal means. When Tacitus called in Injuns Multitudo, 
or a huge multitude of Christians perished in the most sadistic ways. Nero rolled the Christians in pitch, set light to them and used them as living torches to light his gardens. I want you to think about that. How would, I mean, how, I don't know where he got his pitch. Was this, was this tar pitch? Mm -hmm. oh, probably, uh, that would, yeah. yeah. Not pitch from pine trees, that would be too hard to collect. He set them to light and used them as living torches to light his gardens. He sewed them up in the skins of wild animals and set his hunting dogs upon them to tear them limb for limb while they still lived. Now, the source for this is from Barclay, is that yes, right? Yes, again, mm -hmm. yes. So the question, and he, no, he, he gets it from the ancient sources, but yeah, he's, we're quoting here from Barclay. Um, how many Christians today do you think would survive as Christians if this were the, the situation in our day? It is clear that they had a persuasion that was a lot stronger than the persuasion we have today. Yeah. I mean, they knew that every day, if you walked out of your house, you potentially could be arrested and, and be the next person to be burned or eaten alive or killed, crucified. See, in my study of the subject, <clears throat> and in my book, I uh, expand on this problem of the Christians who were persecuted because of their theology. Unlike the Jews, the Christians refused to go to war. They refused to join the armies of Nero or all the others. And as such, they were considered uh, the scum of society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, of course, the, the, the criteria for that right up front is, okay, are you willing to worship the emperor? We're going to talk about that in a moment. Mockery of every sort. Tacitus, one of those early writers, m mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burned to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle and was exhibiting a show in the circus while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloft on a car. Hence, even for criminals who deserved extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion, for it was not, as it seemed, for the public good to, but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. And that's from Tacitus's Annals, chapter 15, verse 44. And Barclay quotes that in the letters to James and Peter. Well, one might think that Peter would be very discouraged, perhaps, and the people to whom he was writing would be ready to give up their faith. But Peter wrote to and of them, We are the chosen people of God. We are the exiles of eternity. The Greek word for a sojourner, that's one of these exiles, in a strange land is Paroikos. A paroikos was a man who was in a strange land and whose thoughts ever turned home. Such a sojourning was called a paroikia, and parochia is the direct derivative derivation of the English word perish. That's where we get our word perish. The Christians in any place are a group of people whose eyes are turned to God and whose loyalty is beyond. What does that mean? Here, said the writer of the Hebrews, we have no lasting city, but we seek the city which is to come. Hebrews 13, 14. So what are we saying here? What are these writers trying to say to us? Am I no longer a citizen of the United States? What's supposed to be, what are we, what are we, how are we supposed to take these words? Well, read on. We must repeat that this does not mean withdrawal from the world, but it does mean that the Christian sees all things in the light of eternity and life as a journey towards God. It is this which decides the importance which he attaches to anything. 
It is this which dictates his conduct. It is the touchstone and the dynamic of his life. There is a famous unwritten saying of Jesus, quote, The world is a bridge. The wise man will pass over it, but he will not build his house upon it. This is the thought which is behind the famous passage in the epistles, the epistle to Diognetus, one of the best known works of the post-apostolic age, quoting, Christians are not marked out for the rest by, uh, from the rest of humanity by their country, or their speech, or their customs. They dwell in cities both Greek and a barbarian. Each has his lot as cast, following the customs of the region in clothing and food and in the outward things of life generally. Yet they manifest the wonderful and openly paradoxical character of their own state. And where is their own state? in heaven. They inhabit the lands of their birth, but as temporary residents thereof, they take their share of all responsibilities as citizens, they pay their taxes, they do their responsible duties, and endure all disabilities as, uh, as aliens. But every foreign land is their native land, and every native land a foreign land. They pass their days upon earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. And just to remind you, Philippians 3, verse 20. We, however, are citizens of heaven, and we eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come from heaven. Of course, those are the words of Paul in Philippians. But Jesus also said that we are in the world, but not of the world. Exactly. Well, it would be wrong, he says, to think that this makes the Christian a bad citizen of the land in which he lives. It is because he sees all things in the light of eternity that he is the best of all citizens. For it is only in the light of eternity that the true values of things can be seen. So we as Christians are the chosen people of God. We are the exiles of eternity. Therein lie both our priceless privilege and our inescapable responsibility. So we are supposed to live as if we are Jesus here on this earth representing his character, his life, his ministry in our duties to the city, the county, the state, the federal government, whatever environment in which we live. So, um, it's important to recognize that in the early days of the Christian church, the Roman government recognized religions that were well established. We mentioned a few moments ago about the Jews and were connected to certain nations, even of their conquered people. But it was against the law to establish a new religion. Why do you think that would be? Well, for one thing, there were already 200 pagan religions around in the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. plus the Jews, and now the Christians. Mm -hmm. And really, they were trying to reduce the number of religions because mm -hmm. they feel that unity is really important, especially in the army. And uh, in a way, this is what happened in the third century, in the fourth century, with, um, in 325, yeah. at the Council of Nicaea, it was an attempt to unite the Roman Empire under one single religion. Well, what happens when you get a bunch of people starting up with a new religion? Yes. Yeah, and the Roman Emperor was a, was a god, yeah. in, in his opinion. He, in in his opinion, opinion, yes. In his opinion. So if you, what happens to a group of people who are on fire for a new religion? The others are threatened. Yeah. Threatened. Yeah, exactly. Well, B.F. Westcourt... It, it's not a whole lot different today. No? They, 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 they want to have unity with something that a lot of, of us can, cannot uh, subscribe to. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what happens if you try to tell somebody to change their religion today? Not easy, is it? Well, B.F. Westcott gives us a quote of the Roman law of this period in early, early Christian history. Quote, The law of the Twelve Tablets, the heart of the Constitution of the Roman Republic, said, quoting, No one shall have gods for himself, alone, at his own pleasure, that would be at his own discretion, at his own choice, and men shall not worship in private new or foreign gods unless they are adopted by the state. So where does that leave? Uh, so that's in the book entitled uh, 
the political works of Marcus Tullius Cicero, uh, compromising the treatise on the Commonwealth and his treatise on the laws, etc. So where does that leave us today? Our yeah. understanding here? And this law was written precisely because the Christians were coming along. <laughs> yeah. It was to, to slow their, their growth and development. Well, Nero certainly thought that the Christians were, you know, attacking the Christians was a great opportunity for him to try to remove the blame from himself, didn't he? Well, what happened to a person that was considered to be a threat to the government, treasonous, etc.? Well, Will William Ramsey says regarding this period in history, at that time, treason was interpreted in a wide sense and was very severely punished. Anything that could be construed as disrespect to the emperor was treason. And to speak of another emperor or king was an unpardonable crime. So what happens if you go to church and you talk about King Jesus? That would be another king. It was, o it was okay to have all these fictitious gods, but it was not okay to have a, a true one. one. <laughs> yeah, right. Good point. So although the pagan temples and their gods continued to be worshipped throughout the cities of the empire, it was a criminal offense not to worship the state and its leader, the Roman emperor. So at Part of Pilate's questioning of Jesus, are you a king? Yeah, you say, exactly. I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. So Pilate must have had a hard time with that. I mean, a king, but not of this world? What are you talking about, you know? Okay, so coming back to our letter here, and now that we've talked a little bit about... By the way, just in passing, uh, well, we're going to mention this in a moment. We'll talk about it. A modern letter written to a group of people which the writer perhaps does not know personally might be addressed, Dear Sirs. We, we know about letters like that. However, ancient letters were addressed in a different way. So look at 1 Peter 1, verse 1. From Peter, apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's chosen people who live as refugees scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. You were chosen according to the purposes of God the Father and were made a holy people by His Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be purified by His blood. Now, take a moment. Pontus. Where is Pontus? Do we know where these places are? Well, I've had the privilege of visiting Pontus a couple of times. Not called Pontus anymore. Galatia? Turkey? Yes, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are all, in those days, they were minor provinces in the northern east of, of Istanbul, on the other side of the the waterway that comes down there, running out across toward Mount Ararat. And so these are various places. And these, these were really main refugee areas for, for Christians. If you go to Ap Cappadocia today, you will see that they built un whole underground communities with underground churches. And you can still visit them. And there's a, there were some volcanoes that went off and they, they covered the land with a, with a porous, I don't know you'd call it porous, but a strange kind of a fairly soft rock called tuff, T-U-F-F. And the, the church, the Christians, found out it was fairly easy to dig this. And so they had these places set up so that if, if they saw a, a threatening military group coming, they could dive into these places and they had... Uh, r r stones that they could roll across the entrance and lock from inside so there's no possible way that anyone could get in unless they're just going to literally dig down through the rock. And so they saved themselves many times uh, by these areas. So these are the areas to which Peter was writing back in, in, in the beginning. And what did he mean by apostle of Jesus Christ? An apostle is someone who's sent so he was sent by Jesus Christ. Okay, exactly. Someone who's sent with a message, presumably, something to say from Jesus Christ. So what does Peter claim as his 
what do you call his 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 authority? I'm sorry. I've been sent by a message as a messenger by Jesus Christ. Exactly. So, um, another great question arises as you read the first few verses of First Peter: Were these primarily Jewish Christians that he was addressing? Now let's think about that for a minute. What were the chances that these were Jews who had turned to be had been joined had become Christians in the northern part of what we would today call Turkey? Was that a likely thing or not a likely thing? Anybody? Any ideas? Mixture. Mixed, yeah. Probably. Okay. We know that when Paul, these, he's the one we know the most about, when he would go to these various cities in those places, where would he go first? The synagogues. To the synagogues. So in North, we know historically that in northern Turkey there were a significant number of Jews. By the way, the, the, the area called Galatia, where did it get its name? From the Gauls. And where did they come from? From France. France, <laughs> France basically, from France. Yeah. So these are European people that had come down. We don't know whether they had come down because of an ice age or what, but they had come down across there, all the way down across um, through all the country. Well, they were different countries, weren't different countries maybe in those days, I don't know. But they had ended up down here and they'd settled here in this northern part of Turkey. Actually, uh, Galicia was a colony of yeah. Gaul. Of Rome, yeah. Of, of Gaul. Of yeah, Gaul. okay, yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. So, there were Jews, there were people, and they were saying, suggesting that there were Europeans there also. It was a, it was a mixture of cultures. W which is uh, interesting, too, because they were speaking a language already spoken in, in Gaul. Yeah. Yeah. So, to take the message to, to France, it's amazing how quickly the message actually got there. And when we study the history of Christianity in those first uh, 400 years, yeah. it's amazing the progress they made all the way into France. Okay, now we're going to struggle with a question here now. So we've talked about there, there are reasons why there were a significant number of Jews in these provinces. But was Peter prim primarily speaking to mainly Gentile Christians? So in those churches, this is, we're just, we don't know that, I mean, no one has given us a statistical breakdown, but what do you think? Do you think those churches in those areas were more Jewish Christians or more Gentile Christians? Probably more Jewish Christians. Okay. Um, there are people who, other people who would disagree with that and say they're more Gentile, but clearly the point is we would want to make them a, a mixture. So what does people, how does people, how does Peter, I'm sorry, how does Peter, Peter address these, these people? Brothers. Okay. And Aliens. He, okay, he, what else does he call them? Chosen because of mm -hmm. the purpose of God the Father. Mm -hmm. They're selected. They're okay, strangers let's. Strangers of the world. Okay, very good. And those terms he uses, um, who, are they, who are they normally referred to? Do they normally refer to? If you talk about someone who possesses the rich blessings that God keeps for his people, he keeps them for you in heaven where they cannot decay or spoil. They are you who are faithful and keep safe God's power for the salvation which is coming. And I go on down here. What Peter does here in this first chapter is he takes these expressions, the sojourners, we've already talked about that one, and he talks about the diaspora, uh, those scattered through, and those terms are usually applied to Jews. And now who is Peter applying them to? Christians. Does he have a right to do that? Well, look at a couple of passages. Look at 1 Peter 2.12. See if if this makes sense. Your conduct among the heathen should be so good that when they accuse you of being evildoers, they will have to recognize your good deeds and so praise God on the day of his coming. Now, would that be likely comment a comment to a Jew that had become a Christian? Or would that be likely a comment of a former Gentile who had become a Christian? Well, look at 1 Peter 4, verse 3. You have spent enough time in the past doing what the heathen like to do. 
Does that sound like it's talking to the former heathen or to the former Jews? Well, it depends if you consider that the Jews were heathen at that point in time. Their behavior. Well, not only their behavior, but their belief system uh, that Jesus called the den of thieves. Yeah. Well, your lives were spent in indecency, lust, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and the disgusting worship of idols. Now, that combination of things would probably be primarily addressed to Gentiles. To Gentiles. So they do not seem appropriate for Jews, although, as Fred has pointed out, some of them probably fit in that category. What did Peter mean when he said, you were chosen according to the purpose of God the Father? We're just going to try to dig a little bit deeper into some of these passages. Does that mean that God has already chosen up there in heaven who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost and we, nothing we can do some translations say you were called rather than chosen. Okay. And I think that's more appropriate because we all called. And these are people who responded to the call. So what do we know, what, what is God's overall attitude toward his children, this, uh, well, t toward everybody who lives on this earth? Look at some passages. I'm going to read 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Who wants everyone to be saved and to come to know the truth. And this, of course, talking about God. So what does God want? Everyone to be saved. Everyone to be saved. Look at Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants all to turn away from their sins. So, and John three sixteen. And I think that's important. Turn away from sin, as opposed to forgiveness. So we were talking about earlier. Yeah. It includes more than the Much prayer. more, yeah. Yeah. And the famous John 3, 16, for God loved the world. How many does that include? Everyone. Everybody. So much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. So do you have to be brown or white or black or Gentile or Jew? You just have unfortunately, what the giving his only son... But that takes on a connotation. Somehow you've got God, the Father, the one you never see, is still angry and he's going to be pleased with a sacrifice of his son, which is still a yeah. pagan concept. Okay. And then even you can go back to the Old Testament. Look at Ezekiel 33, 11. Tell them that as surely as I, the sovereign Lord, am the living God, I do not enjoy seeing sinners die. I would rather see them stop sinning and live. Israel... Stop the evil you're doing. Why do you want to die? Well, you go to Ezekiel 18, yeah. and it says you'll, if you stop doing the bad things, you'll save yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You should, well, well, I guess what, uh, that's in verse 27. Yeah. He shall save his life. Yeah. These verses make it very clear that God wants everyone to be saved. The elect are those who choose to follow God's plan for their lives. God's plan has been in place since before the foundation of the world. And that's in a passage from Ephesians. You remember Ephesians 1 verse 4? Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be His through our union with Christ so that we would be holy and without fault before Him. So does that mean that, he, that there are some who are just chosen and, and others who are chosen, some, to be, some are chosen to be saved and others chosen to be lost? No. This does not mean that God has chosen some to be saved and some to be lost. Not at all. It's God's foreknowledge that allows him to know the end from the beginning. Now, we know that there are a lot of people uh, who have problems with God's foreknowledge, but I believe, I'll let me speak for myself, that even though I don't know how God does it, I, without violating our freedom, he knows what's going to happen. They use an illustration here, which is maybe a partial answer. A mother can tell in advance whether a child is going to choose chocolate cake or green beans without being able to read the child's mind. I wonder how she would know that. Hmm. Does that mean she has foreknowledge, or does she just know her child very well? Well, look now at 1 Peter chapter, uh, chapter 1, 3 to 12. Let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he gave us new life by raising Jesus Christ 
from death. How does that give us new life? If he can raise Jesus from death, he can raise, raise us from death. He can raise us from death. Okay, that's one part of it. It's also true that understanding the meaning of the death and the life of Jesus, the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ helps, fills us with hope. Just as it says, this fills us with the living hope. And so we look forward to possessing the rich blessings that God keeps for his people. He keeps them for you in heaven where they cannot decay or spoil or fade away. They are for you who through faith are kept safe by God's power for the salvation which is ready to be revealed at the end of time. Be glad about this, even though it may now be necessary for you to be sad for a little while because of the many kinds of trials you suffer. I mean, imagine, suppose you had your whole family and you'd all decided to become Christians and one of you gets caught and killed. Would that make you sad? Sure. sure, of course. Their purpose is to prove that your faith is genuine. Do we really need to go through trials to prove that our faith is genuine? No, but it proves it to others. Okay. Even gold which can be destroyed is tested by fire. And so your faith, which is much more precious than gold, must also be tested so that it may endure. Then you will receive praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed. You love him, although you have not seen him, and you believe in him, although you do not now see him. So you rejoice with a great and glorious joy which words cannot express, because you are receiving the salvation of your souls, which is the purpose of your faith in him. It was concerning this salvation that the prophets made careful search and investigation, and they prophesied about this gift which God would give you. They tried to find out when the time would be and how it would come. Do you, which prophets do you think Peter's talking about? The Messianic prophets, so Isaiah. From where? From the Old Testament, right? From the Old Testament, sure. yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have any evidence that anybody in the old, any prophet in the Old Testament really wanted to know how things are going to work out in the end, and some some idea about events that are going to happen down the line. Well, Daniel, especially Daniel, right? And then in the New Testament we have Revelation, but Daniel predicts things way down into almost into our day, didn't he? This was a time to which Christ's spirit uh, in them was pointing and predicting the sufferings that Christ would have to endure and the glory that would follow. God revealed to those prophets that their work was not for their own benefit. Do you remember what, what happened to Daniel when he first re received one of those pro long-term prophecies? He was so sad he was sick. Remember, he, he prayed to God, God, you promised us that in 70 years the Jews would return to Jerusalem. And so then he prays and here comes a vision and suddenly it's talking about 2,300 years. And Daniel is sick. He's literally sick. He says... You know, God, what happened to your promise? And then God gave him some more information, didn't he? So, the, as, they, as they spoke about those things which you have now heard from messengers who announced the good news by the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, these are the things which even the angels would like to understand. What is it possible for us to know from the Old Testament that even the angels would like to understand. Is there any ideas about that? Well, Jesus on the road to Emmaus explained, uh, starting with Genesis, you know, with mm -hmm. books of Moses and mm -hmm. through the prophets, etc., the things about him and how it was uh, prophesied uh, that he must he must die and mm -hmm. r rise again. And do the angels in heaven understand that clearly? That was probably just as mysterious to them as it was to the disciples who had their own expectations. Ellen White but says they, when they first heard that Jesus was going to have to come to this earth and die, they said, no, let us go. Please don't. 
So Peter was moving into the main message of his book. He wanted his audience to know that God the Father and God the Son are preparing a wonderful place for us. But we must be tested now to prepare us to live in that place. Once again, we notice that in 1 in, in Peter 1, 1 and 2, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all mentioned. The Father and the Son are spoken about in more detail in 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9, and the Holy Spirit and his work of inspiring scripture are discussed in 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. We just read that. So look at, look at some comparison between Peter and Paul. 1 Peter 1, verse 3 says, let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of his great mercy he gave us new life by raising Christ from death. This fills us with a living hope. Now what did John say? What does it say in the Gospel of John? Do not be surprised because they tell you that you must all be born again. The winds blow wherever it wishes. You hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. It is like that with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Okay? So Christians are those who have been truly born anew from above. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the reality of which our baptism is only a symbolic repetition. So think again about Peter's, Peter's audience. We're thinking that they're a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. We're also going to learn that they were probably a mixture, maybe half and half of free men and slaves. So it was a real hodgepodge of people in these home churches quietly worshiping God. Peter's audience was suffering a lot of persecution. They never knew when they would be arrested or killed. They could rejoice only in the hope of a resurrection to eternal life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was the key to that Christian hope. What happened to the disciples between Crucifixion Friday and Resurrection Sunday? Well, maybe I should say between Crucifixion Friday and, and Pentecostal Sunday. Did their attitudes change? Oh, yes. Came of one accord. And why, what was the main change? Of, what, do you think, what do you think was the thing that really changed among the disciples? They began to understand the real mission of Jesus and what a real Savior Mm -hmm. of the universe, not just them as individuals, but the whole universe, the kingdom of God to be restored to what it was before sin entered the universe. And one simple corollary to that was, if you die, that's not the end. Jesus has already gone to heaven and he's already promised us a place with him there. So if you're martyred, that's not the end of the story, right? Well, look at 1 Peter 1, verse 4. And so we look forward to possessing the rich blessings that God keeps for his people. He keeps them for you here on this earth? No, in heaven, where they cannot decay or spoil or fade away. Okay? And what we've already read in Philippians 3, verse 20, that we're citizens of heaven. That's what Paul said. Paul described Christians as citizens of heaven. Is that, the, is that true of us now? Would, would it be correct to call us citizens of heaven even now? Sure. Or just, are we just citizens of heaven when we get there? No, we are already citizens of heaven. He raised us up and seated us with him in heavenly places. We have a guaranteed future hope, don't we? That's right. Well, we just read 1 Peter 1.12. Let's just review it. God revealed to these prophets that their work was not for their own benefit, but for yours, as they spoke about those things which you have now heard from the messengers who announced the good news by the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These are things which even the angels would like to understand. What was it that God revealed to the prophets of the Old Testament for the benefit of the people in Peter's day and in our day that even the angels would like to understand? I would like to suggest that this is the introduction of what we would sometimes call the larger view. God is saying the, the plan of salvation involves not just us here in this, in this earth. It's not just that God is gonna, has somehow kind of a plan that he can, he can come and he can save us from death or resurrect us from, from death. 
but he has a plan that involves the entire universe. And that's a, that's a bigger or larger view, in, in my opinion. And I think the, the angels, the angels want to know what, where they fit in this whole picture. Because that's a way, one way to put it. So Peter goes on to say what comes next. So then have your minds ready for action. Keep alert and set your hope completely on the blessing which will be given to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Be obedient to God. Do not allow your lives to be shaped by those desires you had when you were still ignorant. Instead, be holy in all that you do, just as God who called you is holy. The scripture says, be holy because I am holy. And of course, that's all the way back from Leviticus, isn't it? Leviticus chapter 11, 44 and 45. So Peter is challenged. By the way, what does it mean to be holy? Anybody? Set what? Set aside. Set apart. apart. Set, apart Set apart from from the others. Yeah. Okay. It means Peculiar. to be to be sanctified. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, we're going to talk about that more later. What it means to be peculiar. Peter was telling his audience to be alert and be prepared for action. No matter what happens, be obedient. Do not fall back into your old patterns of things as you did in your ignorance. Instead, you must be holy because God is holy. So. Look at the next section in First Peter. We're quickly running down there. Uh, verse 17. You call him Father when you pray to God who judges all people by the same standard according to what each one has done. So then, spend the rest of your lives here on earth in reverence for him. I guess actually we're supposed to go up to verse 21. Let me go back there. Um, for you know that what was paid to set you free from the worthless manner of life handed down by your ancestors, it was not something that can be destroyed, such as silver or gold. It was, not, it was the costly sacrifice of Christ, who was like a lamb without defect or flaw. He had been chosen by God before the creation of the world and was revealed in these last days for your sake. To him you, you believe in God, who raised him from death and gave him glory, and so your faith and hope are fixed on God. Peter said that there was a great, com a great motivation for becoming Christians and living the Christian life. He turned first to the character of God. He exhorted Christians to be holy as God is holy. That's his first point. Secondly, he reminded them that a judgment is coming and everyone will be judged fairly by that holy God. Thirdly, he reminded them that they should rejoice in the fact that they are redeemed as Christians. They had been bought with a very high price, the precious blood of Christ. Verse 19. Furthermore, Peter reminded his listeners that their salvation was certainly no afterthought. It was something planned before the foundation of the world. First Peter 1.20. So what should motivate us today to be Christians? Is it popular to be a Christian in our day? How, how do you feel Some about places. that? Hmm? Some places. Some places not. Some places not. So where would the places be where it's not popular? Uh, well, it's Iraq, interesting. Iraq, yes. Iran, well, Europe. Also, the intellectual yeah. centers are sometimes anti-Christianity. Yeah. So why do we choose to be Christians? For because many of us, Jesus. it's just, just because our parents were Christians? Because, as Paul said, Philippians 3, I consider all these things as worthless compared to the knowledge of knowing Jesus. So, that should be our experience as well. So, Paul, go, I mean, Peter goes on, now that by your obedience to the truth you have purified yourselves and have come to have a sincere love for your fellow believers, love one another earnestly with all your heart. And remember, Peter says, if you truly love other church members, the whole world will know that you're my disciples. Through the living and eternal word of God, you have been born again as the children of a parent who is immortal, not mortal. As the scripture says, all human beings are like grass and all their glory is like wildflowers. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord remains forever. This word, this word is the good news that was proclaimed to you. So that's his first chapter. 
In this verse, Peter discussed the ultimate prize for which Christians are living. We have an immortal inheritance as children of our Heavenly Father because we choose to be like Him and live pure lives. Thus we have become members of God's family, brothers and sisters who love each other. Peter believed that through the purification that came along with baptism and the effort to live holy lives, Christians would come to love each other. They would continue to live obedient, loving lives. Try to think about being a part of one of those Christian groups that went probably by, by different routes and they would quietly come to someone's house and they would meet together there. And you're walking down the street, you have to keep your eyes open for everybody because if you get arrested, you could be killed. But once you get inside the house, you can put your arms around everybody there because these are brothers and sisters. Think about that experience. We know that in, in Greek, there are, there are several words for love. They're translated love in English. There's the word philia, which means friendship. There's eros, which is a passionate kind of love between husbands and wives. There's agape, a pure love that seeks the good of the other. Peter recognized that not every Christian, especially those who, have, who had newly become Christians, would be immediately lovable and attractive. So he expected Christians to exercise agape love toward all in the church. That kind of love comes only from a God who loves in that same way. Agape is no selfish, self-centered, ordinary human kind of love. In this first chapter of 1 Peter, we have seen that Peter was expecting a deep and faithful experience to be norm for all Christians. Ellen White says his or Peter's letters were the means of reviving the courage and strengthening the faith of those who are enduring trial and affliction and of renewing to good works those who through manifold temptations were in danger of losing their hold upon Christ. I'm sorry, hold, their hold upon God. Twice in this chapter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is mentioned. We've talked about the importance of that. While almost everything on this earth is subject to change and corruption, Peter reminds us that we are eligible for inheritance which is incorruptible. Think about that. Would you like to have a part of an inheritance that is incorruptible. It's never going to pass away. It's never going to deteriorate. It's permanent. That is the promise that God makes to us today. Our kind and wonderful Father, we can only thank you enormously for the promises we have in places like here and in 1 Peter. Think that God, that you want us to have inheritance an inheritance that's uncorruptible it can't change it can't deteriorate it can't lose its value you guarantee it in fact it's a you know, an opportunity to live with you forever walking on those streets of gold eating the tree of life and being personally instructed by you whenever we have a question we can't even begin to comprehend how marvelous that will be but we look forward to it as our prayer in jesus name Amen.